Uh, hopefully everybody is seeing that on Zoom. I'm gonna get this microphone clipped on me here before I go too far. Okay, everybody here not okay? Um, my name is Amy Schmidt. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit, of, shifting gears here just a little bit um, from a research project to more of an educational and outreach project. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a, a university course that we've been teaching now for three years um, that is kind of a novel delivery method. And the title of the course is Antimicrobial Resistance from a One Health Perspective. And um, we'll kind of get into not so much the content that we cover in the class, but how the class has worked and what we've learned from it. So it's a very logical question to ask why an engineer is talking about antimicrobial resistance. And um, there's a number of folks around the country doing research in this area, looking at um, strategies from animal feeding and uh, manure storage to treatment to land application, you know, movement in the environment of, of uh, resistant bacteria and the genes that convey that resistance. And we've been doing research at UNL. Um, what we learned is there, there really wasn't an outreach component to that. And so in 2018, we had uh, three different grants funded from USDA that all had, you know, they were all uh, um, extension research um, integrated. And so we were able to develop an outreach program at that time um, that we have called the I Am Responsible Project. And so this is now a nationwide um, outreach program that is aimed at food producers and food consumers. Um, our goal is to improve, first of all, just improve their understanding of what is antimicrobial resistance or drug resistance? Why does it matter? Um, what are the potential risks and some mitigation practices? And then as we all know in extension, we always wanna motivate behavior changes and, um, and so our, our goal in the long term is that we, um, we help food producers and consumers understand their role in mitigating antimicrobial resistance and um, reducing AMR-related food safety and human health risks. So this is our team, um, kind of shows you where we are all across the country. Uh, University of Nebraska is, is the main group that's in the Midwest, and then um, we have a couple of colleagues from uh, University of Maryland, North Carolina State, Oklahoma State, and then several out here in the Western region. Um, and the unique aspect of this is that we are, we're very cross disciplinary. So we have engineers, we have food scientists, we have um, livestock specialists, veterinarians, um, and, and everybody's got an extension appointment. So while we're all kind of doing research in the same area, we all have similar goals in our outreach programs. And so um, three years ago, yeah, three years ago, 2019, summer of 2019, um, myself and Stephanie Lansing and Rohan um, took a car at University of Maryland thought we have all of these, we have all these concepts that we're trying to share. What if we put together a course that we could simultaneously teach at University of Nebraska and University of Maryland? We'd all be on Zoom, everybody was, was familiar with Zoom by that point. And we would teach it at the same time. The speaker would be maybe at one of our schools, but maybe online. So we would all be hearing that speaker at the same time. And we would get students interacting, hopefully engaging with each other across the platform. And so we taught it in um, spring of 2020 that way. Who knew that was gonna be the only way to teach in the spring of 2020, I guess we were, <laughs> we just were ahead of the curve there. Um, so it worked very well. When we turned around in 2021 to teach it, uh, we, we reached out to colleagues and said, does anybody else wanna be part of this? And at that point, um, I don't know, North Carolina State, um, Washington State and Minnesota joined us. And then this third time we taught it, we're teaching it right now, um, Oklahoma State joined as well. And so every year we're, we're kind of expanding who's taking part of it and again, when we teach it for the one hour every week, everybody from all these universities is on Zoom at the same time and um, getting to interact with each other. And really the kind of the outreach component of this is one, we realize this is an interdisciplinary issue. Um, what, what most people would call a wicked problem. I think I have that um, 
to skip ahead here. So this one health idea, we've, I'm sure everybody's heard before, this interaction among people and, and the environment and the animals. And so we really um, wanted to bring together students, not only from different, dis different universities, but disciplines of those working kind of in a medical field, biomedical, um, those working more in livestock production, veterinary medicine, those of us working more in the environmental realm, and sort of, um, I guess, improve our understanding with each other of the challenges that we're facing and get some interaction because that's really the only way this issue of antimicrobial resistance is going to be addressed is across these um, disciplines. And so um, we know that we always hear the term wicked problem. I'm not sure when that was coined, a few years back, I guess, but I, AMR is a wicked problem. So it is, it's global, doesn't matter where you are in the world, there's antimicrobial resistance and there was before people were on the planet. Um, it's very complex. Um, I don't even get into talking about the microbiological side of it because um, you know genetics and, and all that is not my thing, but, but it's complex from so many different angles. And we obviously we've seen that it's a challenge. We really don't have an understanding even if there's a connection between resistant bacteria in the environment or in livestock and a clinical failure of antibiotics in human medicine. So we know we're all connected, but, but that, that um, the points between all those are not really straight lines. We don't really know that yet. And we also know that things that a scientist often don't think about like people's values and their cultural norms, those play a big part in encouraging people to adopt um, practices that, that are being recommended. So with our course, we had um, kind of four general objectives. Um, we wanted to improve the appreciation among the students of how complex AMR is and how necessary it is to have this interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, we wanted to increase their knowledge of AMR principles outside of their discipline. Um, Science communication, I'm sorry, I don't know why these are like not showing up right on there, probably because I use a Mac and Mac doesn't like to talk to PCs. Um, but anyway, we wanted to impre improve their appreciation for science communication, the value of that, and their ability to communicate complex topics, um, which comes back to sort of the extension side of it. Um, we often see a lot of our colleagues do really great scientific work but it never really gets to anybody other than their peers at professional meetings. And so we really wanted to focus on that with the students. And then um, demonstrate the, the value of this engagement of multi, multiple disciplines around problems like this. So these are students, you know, it's a graduate level course. We do have some undergrads who have taken it. These are students who are going to go out with a master's or a PhD and either be teaching or doing research in this area. And I think you know they're they're probably understanding going through their program is that my department, my my discipline is not going to solve this problem. Like we we're going to have to all work together. And so that's kind of the um, the theme that we were um, addressing in the class. And so I I wanted to share just a list of kind of the topics and some of the speakers. We don't necessarily have the same speakers every year that we teach it. Um, some of them we bring back because the students particularly like their presentation. Other times um, we learn about new faculty members at other institutions and, and bring them in. So what I want to point out in our list of topics is that we really go from, you know, just the basics. What is AMR and One Health? Um, we talk to them about principles of extension programming because we want that, we want them to have an understanding of how extension functions in the research arena to get information out. And then we try to hit all of the different, when I say everybody has a role in AMR, it goes from doctors and nurses to um, parents, you know, giving their kids uh, medication in their home to safe food handling and the processes that are used in food processing facilities. So we cover um, AMR, impact on human medicine, um, challenges that it presents um, for animal health, um, AMR in the environment, how it's naturally occurring, what are the challenges associated with mitigating 
uh, resistant bacteria and genes in the environment, um, tracing AMR in the food chain, the history of public attitudes towards microbiology and what it tells us about how to approach AMR is like one of my favorite lectures every year. Um, and uh, we're doing a, a panel session tomorrow that is kind of looking at communication. And Dr. Kari Nixon is one of our panelists for that. And I met her um, like three or four years ago at a conference and she's my polar opposite. Like I'm, you know, engineer facts, don't like to hug people kind of thing. And she's just like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to meet you. And she talks a lot about like, what did we learn a hundred years ago when we tried to convince doctors that hand washing would help prevent the spread of infection among patients? And doctors were like, this is not our fault. We are doctors, you know. Now we know hand washing is like the most basic way to pre prevent the spread of infection. But we need to think about historically what we've learned and how hard it is to change perceptions and encourage people to do something different with themselves um, based on data or, or science. So that's, it's always a really good presentation. And um, if you're able to join us tomorrow, I think you'll really enjoy listening um, to Dr. Nixon. Um, worldwide implications of AMR. So our graduate students that are taking part in this are from all over the world. And rather than us trying to summarize what's going on in Africa versus Southeast Asia versus South America or North America, we have the students form teams, like here's all the regions, jump in here where you would like to research this. And then we did a lecture this semester where we broke, went into breakout rooms and we had at least uh, one student from each of the regions represented in that breakout room and they shared what they had learned. And so um, that was a really great way for us all to learn um, based on you know, kind of what they found was the most interesting aspects in the regions that they studied. Um, and then we were finishing up this semester with um, looking at challenges related to development of new antibiotics and alternatives to antibiotics. So we try to cover, like I said, kind of that full range of every aspect of AMR that, um, that we think is important. So here's some of the things um, students said, and this is from uh, years one and two of the class. We haven't um, assessed this year, but yeah, but 85% um, of the students said the course stimulated their interest in topics related to AMR, which we would expect if they were taking the class, they're probably in a field where AMR is, is an issue. So 85% um, said they found value in engaging with students from other institutions and disciplines. I should mention um, for their final project in the class, we team students up across institutions we, they can go in, we have a spreadsheet, they can go in and like suggest a topic. And what they're doing is suggesting, um, uh, maybe it's antimicrobial resistance in hospital settings is what they want to talk about. And then they form a small team, two or three students. And their goal is to identify an audience. Is it the doctors? Is it the um, custodial staff? Is it the patients that they want to that they wanna share a message with about AMR in that, that setting, just like we would do an extension. Who's our audience? What's the message? What do we want the outcome to be? And how do we deliver that in a way that resonates with them? So their final project is to develop an outreach product based on an audience and a message and their intended outcome. Um, so they do get to, we, we don't pair up students from the same university on that. So they do get to work across disciplines and, um, I think it's challenging for them because um, you're trying to kind of come up with this collective idea and you don't know the other students you're working with. But I think what they, the value they get out of that is like, oh, I see how difficult it is to take an idea and try to deliver it in a way that we know it's gonna be impactful um, because we know that's not always easy to do. Um, and 77% said the course helped them appreciate the value in sharing scientific information using um, research-based uh, proven communication methods. Uh, they, they thought the class was really great for networking. My favorite, I didn't really understand extension before taking this course. So a lot of these students have probably the same viewpoint I did as an undergrad and graduate student or maybe not so much as a graduate student, but I just thought all professors taught classes and I didn't realize you know, the research side and the outreach side and the things that they were doing. So, um, so it's really good that, that we're helping them understand what extension is all about. Um, 
hearing how other institutions are addressing this topic was helpful. So they would like to continue bringing more institutions into it. Um, creating that scientific communication project was not an easy task, but it was a good exercise. And they liked how broad the class was hitting all of those different areas on this topic. So the instructors, um, all of them felt that the web-based delivery helped them deliver a class that they probably otherwise would not be able to deliver to their students. And that was what we found initially is, well, I'd like to teach this class because I have grad students working in this area, but it'd be like one person a year. And we know that that's not gonna make a full class. With our, um, with our six universities involved this year, we have 25 or so students taking the class from all over the country. So um, again, I can offer it with only one person taking it from UNL since it's online. Um, I think we have three from UNL this year, but we're, we're reaching a lot um, broader audience by having it in this format. Um, one of our goals from the I Am Responsible team was like, everybody that takes this class is gonna love this idea of extension and antimicrobial resistance, and they're gonna wanna help us generate content, um, outreach content for their program. You know, maybe they didn't love it as much as we hoped they would, but um, we still, there's people interested in like, yeah, I see how my research could be shared through that, that route of extension and, um, and students too, and speakers, some of our speakers that say like, this is so cool. I have research I've done that I would, I'd love for you to get it out through that, um, through that portal. So, and then finally, um, so far we haven't run anybody off. Everybody has said, yeah, I want to teach this again next year. So it's just grown each year. Um, and we're really happy with that. Um, some of the feedback from instructors, instructors um, that the class exemplifies integration of research and outreach, even though it technically falls under teaching and most of us don't have teaching appointments. I don't, several of the extension folks don't. Um, but as extension specialists, it's really, it's really um, been satisfying to teach outreach principles to students who may not otherwise ever encounter that. They're probably working for research and, and teaching faculty and maybe never really um, get exposed to extension as part of the land grant university system. And um, while I don't have a teaching appointment, I see value in offering the course because it exposes students to extension programming and um, forces them to think through that process that we do of what's our desired outcome and then how do we work backwards to design a program that we hope achieves um, that outcome that we're intending for our audience. So looking ahead, <clears throat> um, I think we'd, <clears throat> excuse me, we'd like to look at folks, you know, two, three, four years from now who took it in the initial year or two and see how it has impacted them in their professional program. Did they, you know, are they kind of known as the person in their group that understand science communication the best? Did they end up going into a role that um, was really interdisciplinary, whereas they thought before maybe they'd kind of focus on one area? Um, we wanna promote and expand delivery of the course to additional institutions. I know we had um, three speakers so far this year who have said next year, I wanna I want be one of the instructors for this. So I think we'll have at least three more schools next year. And we're always looking for additional or new speakers for the course. Um, if you know of somebody who, who works in this area and you think, man, I've heard them talk and they're, they're just really engaging, we love to um, connect with new speakers. Not that we don't love all the ones we've had, but um, we feel like we need to change it up a little bit year to year so we're not always uh, calling on the same folks to speak for the class. So, And some of our final thoughts, and I apologize again for how the layout's messed up. Um, we, we really feel like STEM professionals who are coming through the college setting now and those who have taken our class, they're, they're starting to really see a value in science communication and they're seeking out ways to improve their ability to communicate, um, you know, develop those outreach skills. And so we think, you know, this type of course um, in different topic areas could be valuable, particularly because if anybody is working in extension, you know that there's not as big a pipeline of extension professionals coming in as there are going out through retirements and things like that. And so we find ourselves being spread thinner and thinner. Um, and so we really need to focus on training that next generation of extension professionals and 
And hopefully this is a way that these students are being exposed to this uh, career path that maybe they hadn't uh, considered before. <clears throat> So we do have a booth um, down at the end of the hall next to the registration table. If you want to swing by, we have information. Um, we started a podcast recently, um, the Tales of Resistance podcast. And um, I, don't, I'm, I don't need that, so it's not too boring. Um, some of my staff um, really got into, they're really into the podcast world. And so they, they run those and they're pretty, they're pretty, I don't know, they're pretty entertaining to listen to. Um, and then our program in general, like we would love to have new people join who want to work in this area and help um, share the, the outreach content that we're developing as a team. So with that, I will um, go ahead and stop and I'll take questions if you have them, um, <clears throat> either from online, I'll have to check those, or in the room. Oh, okay, so for the I Am Responsible project. So, um, <clears throat> I, we started out, we got our first funding in 2017 and, and 18. We just um, had a couple of projects funded in 2020 and 2022. So we are still continuing this outreach program, but we really um, realize that we need to, you know, most of the most of the grants that we put in, right, are going to be like 66% research and 20, 30% extension. And we kind of need to flip that so that we do have a bigger extension budget because it's hard to get people to be part of this team and contribute if we're not funding them in some way. And so this initial round, we were doing sub awards to the other schools that worked with us. Um, and we need to continue that. So, um, so we are seeking additional funding, but one of our, I think one of the best ways we keep it going is people are putting in research projects to the AMR in the food chain program with USDA and they really don't want to get into the extension part. They're interested in the research. So they sub-award us a big portion of the budget to do the outreach component. And that involves, you know, you send us your research and tell us what you found out and we'll create graphics and social media and we'll distribute it and we'll assess the impact. Um, and so that's really helpful to those audiences that don't have the extension expertise um, in-house. <clears throat> 